I'm going to invite us all to join in the call to worship. If you're in Zoom, you'll find it on your screen. And if you are, and if you're in Zoom, go ahead and mute yourselves. And if you're here in the sanctuary, you'll find it in your bulletin in the call to worship. Like Peter, like Mary, we have a message to share. Christ is risen. 2,000 years ago, Christ preached love and liberation among us. Now Christ is risen. Long ago, Christ walked among us and showed us the way. For the risks he took, he died. Yet that was not the end of the story, for death was overturned. The way is open, and Christ is risen. This morning, out of the shadows of confusion, despair, sorrow, anger, and fear, we turn to the radiance of hope, healing, surprise, and joy. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. And I'm going to invite everyone now, if you're able to stand with your hymnal in your hands. Turn to page 206 and you'll find I danced in the morning and we will sing all the verses of that song together.
Okay, um, feel free to be seated. This is the time in the service when we invite your prayers. I'm going to give you those prayers that we're already raising up every week out loud. And then I'll invite those prayers that you wish to share first of concern, followed by those of gratitude and celebration. At this time, we continue to pray for Scamp, for Huntley, for Mary, the granddaughter of Sasha, for Richard and Sandra, for Richard and Joyce, for John, for Nancy, for Ben, for Sue, who will be going through surgery soon, for Bob, who will be undergoing surgery soon, for Arden, who misses Ray, Leah and Bill, Alice, Ben, Nancy, Barry and Jan, the Kellogg family, Ron, for the Ukraine, for the countries surrounding the Ukraine, both those that have chosen aggression and those who are trying to receive refugees and provide support and are also threatened, and for our world. If there are prayers of concern in the sanctuary, first I need, who has the wireless microphone? Okay, Cheryl has it. Okay, so we're gonna ask you to talk into the microphone. Hopefully it won't be super loud. And um, the people in Zoom will be able to hear you and then we'll be able to hear people in Zoom when they talk to us as well. So does anybody here in the sanctuary have a prayer of concern that you would like to raise up out loud? If you do, please raise your hand so we can bring the microphone to you. Apparently I named all of them. In Zoom, Jeanette, do you see anybody that is uh, wanting to share a prayer of concern? Go ahead, Sue. For my friend, Matt, who is um, having issues and I'd like him to be a happier person, we pray for that he will find the guidance he needs. Bless him. Other prayers in Zoom? I believe that's it. So for Matt. We balance out the prayers of concern that we continue to carry, including those for um, people called to serve who are on the front lines in the military, in medical establishments, as first responders, people who find them on the front themselves on the front lines who never expected to be the front line of anything and continue to be those who respond to world conditions like pandemics. We lift up our prayers and hold people in the light. We also balance out these cares that we hold with those moments, those experiences that offer us a pause for perspective, for gratitude, for joy. Chris and I went on a Tin Mountain ducks and donuts outing yesterday and saw a harrier I guess it's a type of a hawk, a, mar a marsh hawk. And it was hunting around the periphery of a pond. And in the middle of the pond were merganser ducks a, a spe uh, and, and buffle heads. And the buffle heads are fairly rare here. And the two guys were fighting over the one girl. And so there was a lot of activity and it was well worth the outing because we got donuts and we got to see lots of ducks and other birds. And I learned two bird calls, so that's pretty great. I think I can identify a Phoebe now. Who has anything in their lives that has given them gratitude or made them happy? If you have any such thing, please raise your hand. We're starting the sanctuary and Cheryl will bring the microphone to you. Is anybody happy it's Easter? Yeah, you guys are really quiet. I think they're all up for the sunrise service. In Zoom, is anybody happy? 
Sue, go ahead. Well, I'm very happy that this coming Wednesday, I will be a better, more solid person. So I am very happy about this. So there's something to be happy about. Thank you, Sue. She's, she's gonna be happy for her new shoulder. I see, lot, I see lots of smiles, but no one else raising their hand. Okay. Oh. Somebody else? I'll go ahead. Oh, hi. I'm very happy because I adopted a wonderful cat from Harvest Hills Animal Shelter, and she's a love bug. That's great. New, new animals in our lives or the animals we already have who give us joy. We are grateful for them. I'll add that it's my daughter's birthday today, so we're going to be going to spend time with her later today. Here, I think we have a prayer of happiness, so um, Cheryl's going to bring the microphone. Who, who? Oh, in the back. Oh, Gail's happy. Different Gail, not me, Gail. Hi. Um, happy day for everybody. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really happy. I have a very dear, dear friend that um, has moved about 10 years out to Washington State. Um, he has a horse farm there. Um, his wife worked in a um, vet clinic, and one day they found her laying on the floor with her head split open. Nobody knew what happened to her. She fell off a high, um, not a stoop, what do you call it? A stool. ladder, stool, yeah. yeah. And she is um, finally, after five years, she's put back together. So I'm going to see her too. And uh, I am just elated. So Gail's going out west to see, you're going out west to see these friends, aren't you? Yes, I am, Washington All right. State. So for a trip to see dear friends, and I think you have somebody special going with you. I do. Okay, I so for travels <laughs> with loved ones. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else in Zoom or here in the sanctuary? All right. I'm going to ask that we all pray together then. Uh, wait a minute. Claire wants to say something. Oh, Claire. Okay, go ahead. Claire. Unmute yourself, Claire. <laughs> Me not having an opportunity to talk? No, just, um, I was just saying, I'm just so grateful for the peepers and the wood frogs and the, the changes of season. It's, 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 it, there's change going on everywhere, but it's just so, so wonderful to go out and just have your ears assaulted by all these amazing little one inch little frogs that are um, that are just enjoying life. It's just it's a reminder just to get on out and enjoy the moment, for me anyways. For the music of the world, for peepers and birds and everything that's giving us joy. People, leaf blowers. Please pray with me. Oh, holy God. This day, among all days, you remind us that you are the one who surprises us. That when we think we have everything in hand, when we think we have everything planned and we know what is ahead of us, you will surprise us. You will surprise us with sound systems that go crazy and humble us before we find our way through them. You will surprise us with people that come into our lives at just the right moment. You will surprise us by what we learn about the world you will surprise us with your presence, with your love that is alive, that will show itself to us when we least expect it, perhaps when we think there is no hope or love or presence to be with us. And sometimes we will only know it when we look backwards. For your love, which is a healing love, which is a hopeful love, which is a tenacious love that refuses to be turned away from us, that insists upon finding us wherever we are. We are grateful. And we are grateful for the people, for the other four-legged and winged beings who are part of our world and our lives and show us love in a whole other way. 
for the beauty of your creation, which is both strong and fragile. We ask that you will remind us every day to be grateful for this world in which we walk and the lives that we encounter and that you will remind us that all these things are in our keeping. We offer you now our silence. And we lift our voices up together, praying out loud. And if you are in Zoom, try and muting, and we're going to see if we can do this without pulling out our eardrums. Our Father, Father who, art in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be, hallowed thy, be thy name. Thy kingdom, thy kingdom come. Thy will, I will, will be done as on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this, give us this day our daily, daily bread, and, and forgive us our sins. As we, as we forgive as we those who sin against us, lead us not into temptation, temptation, but deliver us from, from evil. For that is the kingdom, power, power and, glory and the glory forever. forever. Amen. And if you're in Zoom, you can go ahead and mute. And we're going to enjoy another moment of music with Dominique. So please just. Put your feet on the floor, center yourselves, and receive the gift of music.
from John 20, verses 1 to 18. The resurrection of Jesus. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went to the, toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Babani, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers, and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father, to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them she, that he had said these things to her. I just want to acknowledge that Bob Carper, who is reading for us, is also being our emergency sound tech person in the closet. So appreciation for the multitude of gifts that we all offer to each other so that we can stay connected. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Earlier I said that God is a God who surprises us. And the ultimate surprise is the empty tomb. The ultimate surprise is Mary going with her spices, believing that she will be tending to a body and finding that indeed the stone is rolled away and there is no body. And even then she doesn't understand and she's looking for that body so that she can tend to the one that she followed and loved and honor him in death as she honored him in life. For those of us that have walked with somebody towards their death, we will make the commitment to be with somebody when they cross that threshold if it is possible for us to do so. And occasionally we help to take care of somebody's body even after they have passed. This is what she sought to do and yet instead what she found was emptiness, hollowness. She thought that her master, her teacher had been stolen away disrespected one more time. And this is one trauma on top of days of trauma. Let us not make light 
of the events that led to the morning where the sun comes up and someone goes to grieve and doesn't find what they expect and grieves more and more deeply while seeking for what they have believed to be taken away from them, in this case, a body. Angels talk to her and ask her why she's weeping. And then she turns and sees somebody who she thinks is the gardener. And it's apt that the one she thinks she sees is a gardener because indeed, I'm the vine, you are the branches. This is one who has tended to life itself and offers life itself. But she thinks he's a simple gardener and that perhaps he can direct her to where love has gone, where love has been stolen away. And instead, he calls her by her name. He has already healed her earlier in her life from mental health issues that plagued her, that robbed her of so much experience and identity and connection to self and community. He healed her of those things. And now she is a faithful follower. And he calls her by her name. And he connects her one more time to holy love. Recognizing her, she's suddenly being seen and being called by her name, understands who it is that is speaking to her. And she calls him teacher. And he tells her she can't hold on to him yet. He is going ahead. But he asks her to carry the news of what she has witnessed to others. And we know that from those stories, there will come additional appearances and resurrection, ex post-resurrection experiences. And that the followers of Christ, men and women, will carry the story and the message and the actions of love out into the world and put their own lives at risk over time. How do we connect the story of a woman in a garden 2,000 years ago to our own lives? Where do we see resurrection and what does it mean? To me, one of the things that this day means is that we have been freed of those bonds that hold us back, that are, again, death dealing. We have talked about this. We talked about it a few weeks ago when we talked about Lazarus being called out of his tomb. Now, truly, love has overturned death. And we are not all called to the cross to be executed, but we are called to a new way of being and a new way of living and loving. And in that turning towards a holy and a holistic love, we are called away from those things that harm us, that separate us from ourselves, our own family, our own community, our world, and God. And we will experience people in our lives who embody this kind of journey. And so today I share with you the journey that my family is literally taking today and tomorrow. And it is a journey that we have been taking for 22 years now. We are going down tomorrow to the end of the Boston Marathon. We will wait beyond the finish line for an athlete named William Tan. How many of you have heard me talk about William before? All right, so this is a new, not a new story, but I'm going to share it again. Our daughter, Jessie, was paired with William, who is a Paralympic athlete from Singapore in 2001. She was a cancer patient, and he was partnered with a patient from Children's Hospital Boston so that he could do fundraising through the Boston Marathon on behalf of Children's Hospital. And every athlete is paired with a partner, and in this case, it was Jesse, and we forged a deep friendship with William. And that friendship endured for the six years of Jesse's life 
when she was on and off treatment for leukemia. One of the best moments was the day that she sat on his lap and they crossed the finish line together. And even after she died, he kept coming back from wherever he was in the world. And he set world records and he did them on her behalf. He traveled all over the world and did half marathons on different continents. But for William to become the man that we met, he went through his own journey of overcoming the bondages of his body and his mind. Because from the age of three on, he couldn't walk. For a long time, he was just strapped into a chair and his brother and sister carried him on their back to get him to school. He didn't even have a wheelchair. He had no mobility. Eventually, he got a wheelchair. And he started to dream of becoming a doctor and the people in his community, in his culture told him, you should probably focus on working with your hands. Do something useful for society that involves your hands. But he had a brilliant mind and he felt like he had something to prove. And so he started doing these wheelchair races and becoming an, Im an impressive athlete with the body that he had. He thought if he passed enough speed records and, and earned enough medals that somehow it would prove his worth, his merit. He got a PhD in neuro, neuroscience and worked at the Mayo Clinic, but he still wanted to be a doctor. And somewhere along the way, he was exposed to and chose Christianity as his faith. And the people that he first met told him that if he prayed just the right way, he would learn, he would be able to walk again. That somehow his body would magically overcome the damage done by polio. And he would get out of his wheelchair and he would be able to move without it. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed in different ways. And it never worked. He never got out of his wheelchair. And he started to wonder if there was something wrong with him or the way he prayed, what was wrong? And then he began to understand that perhaps his liberation and his mobility would not be the mobility of his body in quite that way, but that it would be one to put his body to use in service of others, in part by doing things like these fundraising events for children all over the world, but also to put his mind, his intellect to work in research in different areas and to actually pursue becoming the doctor that he wanted to be. And he had to go to Australia to get his degree. And then he kept studying and he got postdocs at Harvard and he got postdocs at, it's either Oxford or Cambridge, don't quote me on which one, in England. He's a very brilliant man. By the time we met him, he stopped being chained down to the idea that if he prayed the right way, he would walk. And he stopped being worried about whether that was the measure and the limit of his life. And he began to understand that the impact he could make wasn't defined by the chair or what he could and couldn't do with his legs, but what he did with his heart and his mind and his life and the body just the way it is. So the man we met was already changing lives and continues to change lives even now. But like our daughter, he also came down with leukemia. And he went through a bone marrow transplant. His sister gave her stem cells to him and his body changed again. So we weren't sure he would ever race again, but he did. He races in a different type of racing chair now. He can't bend his legs the same way that he could before, but he still races every year. And you know that even in the Boston Marathon in the wheelchair division, you have to hit a certain speed and time limit to even qualify, and he does every year. And we haven't seen him since the pandemic, but he's coming back. He landed on Thursday. He's here in this country to race again. Resurrection looks like people who have been freed of the limitations that are hurting them the ways that we think of ourselves or that others tell us that we are less than we could be. 
and that if we do things just the right way, we'll get this other outcome. When we stop being limited by what people tell us or what we have hurt ourselves by believing, when we are freed of messages that tell us that's the only outcome you should seek, and we begin to open ourselves to the surprise of what is possible in our lives, we are free to be who we are capable of being when we are connected to love, to other people, and to the world, and to the fullness of self that is the gift we have been given. And maybe the fullness of self looks different than you expected it to be. But I assure you, it is amazing. The people that Christ entrusted with love and a message were very imperfect. They denied him when he was pulled away and taken to trial and executed. They didn't get the story their whole lives. They didn't get it until after he died. But they got it. And they continue to tell that story, and they lived it out. And apparently, they did a good enough job that we're still telling the story now, 2,000 years later. And we, too, believe that we can be transformed by the love that we meet in the garden or in the emergency department or in the auditorium where someone plays beautiful music or the schoolroom or outside hunting eggs maybe in the sanctuary, wherever we meet love, it can change us. And it won't just be in a church. It will be wherever we are. Love will find us there. And it will surprise us. And it will know our name. And we will never be the same. Thanks be to God. So we're going to listen to the Easter song that was prepared by the choir. We're going to pray for great sound. So sit back and listen. Hear the bells ringing, bells singing, that we can be born sound pretty good, huh? 
gratitude to the people that are recording their voices, to Rebecca Moore, who from Mexico has been directing a virtual choir during the season of Lent, and how technology does work sometimes. We're going to invite you now to come forward. There are tons and tons of daffodils here, and there's mesh on this cross. And this is the symbolic ritual of transforming what is an instrument of execution into a symbol of hope, new life, and returning love. Please come forward as Dominique is playing the harp and take flowers and help us transform the cross into the symbol of Easter.
At the end of the service, if anybody wants to add flowers to the cross, we would welcome you to do so. We will be carrying it outside and bringing the rest of the flowers out so that others throughout the afternoon can continue to flower the cross with us in this community. We faithfully remind you that our presence here in the valley is not solo, that we are one of many churches, and that together we do the work of service in this valley and in other parts of the world, and this is made possible through your contributions. So we ask that you will continue the faithful giving that you have shown us throughout the pandemic. Our doors have been open 24 seven that whole time, but um, there are envelopes or there's jxncc.org if you like to do things online. And you can put the envelopes in the plates out front or in the little white church out front. And we thank you for your gifts and your steadfast support of our work. So we're going to turn to page 205 in our hymnals, and we're going to rise for one final song together, and then we will roll from there into the benediction, which you can also find in your bulletin. So page 205, if I'm correct, does that look right? And if you are in Zoom, the words will be up on the screen. And somebody in Zoom, tell me how many um, verses you see. Three verses. Three verses. Okay. So we're going to do Christ the Lord lives again and love's redeeming work is done. Is that right? Correct. Jeanette? Yes. Okay, good. First three verses. Yay, we've got it. We're in synchronized. And we're going to, Alan, I'm going to give you back the microphone so everybody can hear the organ.
Brothers and sisters, go transform not by this moment, by all the moments of your lives where peace has come to you, love has found you and surprised you, and you have been changed. Offer this love to those that you meet along the way, that you too may be the hands and the feet of love in the world. Go in peace.